Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll make a start now. Um, so, oh, please do come through, come round. We've got plenty of seats around here. This is just the bit where I talk about toilets, so it's fine. You can transition through. Um, my name's Anna, and I'm the Director of Community Learning here at Richmond Hillcroft Adult Community College. I've not worked here long enough to be able to say that as quickly as I should. And with that, I will hand over to Rachel Morrison from English Heritage, who'll do a much more professional introduction. I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Inspiring talks by inspiring women for inspired people. It is really fantastic to have you here to share about our local fantastic women. But uh, this is all based on Marble Hill. And we have been very lucky to have been revived. Marble Hill is a beautiful Georgian villa set in 66 acres of public park. And it's open free for five days a week to be enjoyed and also to hear about the amazing woman who was remarkable and who is the inspiration for today's event. Henrietta Howard lived about 300 years ago. She was born in, in London, went to Blickling Hall and there she lived until she was 12 when her, parent, her father was in a duel, he lost, her, lost his life. She then became an orphan, uh, losing her mother as well. But then things got worse. She married her first husband, because that was the thing that you would do as a woman in Georgian times. And sadly, he was a, a really horrible gentleman, actually. There's nothing redeeming for him. Um, he was a gambler, he hoard, he took all her money. And actually, at that point then, they were left and she was, had to change her name because she feared for the debtors. Thinking on her feet, she went over to Hanover like many other people did at the time, and there she ingratiated herself with the, the queen, uh, the soon-to-be queen, and then the king. The king gave her 11,500 pounds, and with that, she created Marble Hill. She was a woman of disability, but let nothing stop her, and was a friend to patrons of the arts. And she came back to Marble Hill, left court, and remarried and gave her heart to someone who, who loved her for who she was. And she had the happiest years of her life in Marble Hill. Marble Hill sits between Richmond and Twickenham and is an English heritage uh, property, um, which is a charity. And so it is lovely to be able to celebrate through the revival, not only the opening of the house or the, uh, the landscape and its um, transformation, but also the sports facilities being transformed and supported for our community. It's also allowed us to do fantastic events like this, and using Henrietta, having women at the heart of a woman who got, who went, who, who was able to fight against lots of things at the time and was able to ha have a house, able to have land and was able to gain a legal separation, which was never possible at the time. It's great to be able to use her name to be able to talk to these fantastic women and also to be able to work with White Ribbon Charity that work to support women who have been domestically abused. So I am so grateful for each one of you coming today to be able to hear from these fantastic local women who inspire us, but also to arc back to the history that has made this all possible. So it is without further ado that I get the opportunity to welcome our amazing women today. They're local women who have put their stamp on community, who've been able to make their work inspirational. And I can't wait to welcome them to the floor. So the first person I'm going to pass you over to is the wonderful Laura. And she's a volunteer at Shepherd Star. And um, I will leave Desiree to tell you a little bit more. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Visit Richmond. Thank you to our councillors. And thank you for being here, Laura. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful introduction and such a warm welcome and a warm welcome to each and every one of you here today. For all you incredible women in the audience and your champions, the men who sit among us as well. So welcome. I hope that tonight is inspiring and encouraging. 
I know just as I sit amongst this group of very influential and very encouraging, inspirational women, I'm so buoyed up and I really am so proud to share a stage with them today. So it is a real privilege for me to be here. And I'd like to start this evening off just by introducing Desiree. Desiree is a co-founder of a local charity called Shepherd Star. Now, since she was young, Desiree has always had a heart for her community and in particular for creating opportunities for provision for those who are in need. She is a co-founder of three charities, one in South Africa and two here in Richmond-upon-Thames. She's a community connector. She's also an entrepreneur and she's got experience in both the corporate and the charity sector. So Desiree, without further ado, hmm. can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Laura mentioned that when I was young, I was looking out for people in need. And when I was preparing for this evening, I was thinking it actually all started with the volunteering opportunities that my parents encouraged me to participate in. And I started at a very young age, volunteering in an orphanage, a homeless project, a rehabilitation center for young people, and a prison. Never in those young years did I realize those seeds of such great value that were deposited in my heart and how those seeds would influence the course and the future of my life in the charity world. I also at a very young age was able to recognize the richness and the reward that came from giving, sharing and this is one thing that I, in my home, try and encourage that it is better to give than to receive. And so right at a young age, I had that experience. In 1994 in South Africa, I co-founded a community home. It was the first charity that I set up and we were in the heart of, at the time, the red light district and we took children whose mums had to work. We also had feeding programs for those that were homeless. That experience, once again, equipped me with education, life lived experience that I could bring when I came here to the UK. I arrived fast forward in the UK in 2000 from South Africa. I uh, got married just before to one of the volunteers from the project, <laughs> kind man who had vision. And we landed and I got back into corporate life and enjoyed working more on a global stage here, which obviously the UK presents. And I continued with that for a while and had two um, young girls, well, they're young teenagers now, had two girls. And when the one was about a year old, um, I had this vision of going back and working with street people. And I thought, well, that's so odd because my life has just started family life in, South Af in the UK. So how would I work with street people? Because this is where we located and we weren't planning on going to Africa or some place where there was extreme poverty. And I then, through my connections in the community, um, met with a, a co-founder and we started the Vineyard Community Centre in 2011 and I served there till 2020 and that first project that was started there was serving those with no fixed abode so that vision was fulfilled and then projects developed from that. Coming out um, from the centre in 2020 it was the the pandemic and I was on the front line looking for opportunities to see where could we meet needs and I was joined by the lovely Laura, Timmy, Kat and Mary and we formed a group called Warrior Woman <laughs> and we would be out there looking for where's their need and how can we try and meet that need and the strong desire just started to be all consuming that this is what we needed to do and so really out of warrior woman came the co-founding team of shepherd star 
such an inspirational story because a lot of people can come up with ideas but when you surround yourself with people that not only have ideas but put them into action and take agency incredible things can happen so tell us what does shepherd star do what are your events and programs and how does shepherd star affect the individual mm -hmm. who are some of the individuals who would come to shepherd star the vision that we had when we formed shepherd star was that we believed everyone should be connected, valued and contributing in the community. And so we used that really as our vision. And we launched with four, four projects, community-based projects. And it was just incredible that we had the opportunity during the pandemic to identify the gaps where we believe that we could fill and for some complement the works of other uh, charity organizations. So the first project that we started was Explore, followed by a Table of Hope, Steps and Shine. So Explore is our self-development and um, building confidence program. It runs uh, four times a year and we work with partners to deliver that. The partners are organizations that specialize in a particular skill or in a program where we believe folk who are on the Explore program will benefit. So for example, for well-being, you'll hear from Susie from Take Seven Simple Steps, Booty, um, Sam has already been sharing as an inspirational woman here, and other organizations, Q Gardens, Richmond Furniture Scheme, Citizens Advice Bureau, and more recently, English Heritage. So we work with partners who align on the same vision, mm -hmm. who want to see a life empowered, changed, and contributing. And so through this program, we are able to do that. We reach out to participants and we found that there's definitely a, an increase since the pandemic mm -hmm. where people have perhaps lost their confidence. Where's the direction that they should be mm -hmm. journeying on? And so our hope is that with those coming on to the program, mostly referred through local agencies as well as the, the local job centre in Twickenham, that people will start to rediscover uh, their potential, that that confidence inside of them will be reignited, something of purpose will start to um, flow. And our, our hope is that we can direct them. Mm -hmm. So through the Explore program, we then work with partners that we connect with, and that individual might then continue the journey with that partner. Thank you. Desiree, just there's so many seasons to your life, mm -hmm. and you're sharing now about stepping into the charity sector. Just as a woman, both in the corporate and the charity sector, we encounter challenges. What are some of your greatest learnings? What, what have you learned through some of the challenges you've encountered? And what is it inside of you that causes you to rise? Hmm. Well, I think for some of the ladies here, getting the balance in the home life is, is um, quite tricky at times. <laughs> and um, not to have all of your passions and the things that um, you make you rise, um, not to lose that in trying to facilitate the management of the home and raising a family. And so that's quite hard because mostly we put others before ourselves. And so for a long while, I almost lost my identity, if you like, um, and lost my way in, in terms of where should I be um, journeying and stepping back into the corporate world there was that satisfaction for a period of time but that longing desire to do something that makes me uh, rise which for me it's giving it's serving needs and finding the space to fuel that and we we can be I think as as women quite um, hard on ourselves and not provide not um, protect that space mm. where we can fuel our passions where we can engage with the things that we were created to do and for me I've come into a place where I've now realized the things that needed to be protected in order for me to live a more purposeful life 
And the one thing that I have learned is for a long while I tried to journey alone as an individual. And I have come to realize that, oh my word, <laughs> there's nothing better than working in a team where you align on your heart's desires and your passions, your vision and your values. And so that's how um, we established Shepherd Star. And there's just so much um, that comes from working in teams. So I think the challenge for me was, um, well, basically, learning the hard lesson that you can't do it alone mm -hmm. that actually you need to be in community mm -hmm. and I think that's also the heart of what we do is connecting mm -hmm. community as we help others. Thank you Desiree and that's a beautiful segue into community and connecting communities and I want to introduce you to someone now someone who's been impacted greatly by Shepherd Star but what I love so much is it's not it's not a one-way connection. This is something where we've learned so much from her and there's a real exchange in gifts. So I just want to invite Denise up to the stage. Denise, will you join me here, please? Denise is one of our community stars. She is a member of Shepherd Star community and she's someone who has really experienced firsthand what it means to just be a part of this community, a part of this charity. And I'm not going to speak anymore because I'd love to just ask Denise, in your own words, we're delighted to have you here. Yeah. Thank you for coming up. And could you just tell us, how did you stumble across Shepherd Star? Um, I'm a bit nervous, obviously it's the first time I've done something like this. Um, I came across um, Shepherd Star because um, I was helping at another food bank called Etna that runs um, food on three days a week for the homeless and people with hardship and I was part of the contribution of and, um, helping the fair share that um, distributes um, bread and rolls for the local communities so we don't have wastage from the, the top supermarkets um, so I was part of that and I was fortunate to be introduced to Desiree um, and she um, invited me to her first um, Table of Hope and I just saw, you know, the amazing things that she was doing and how, how um, kind-hearted she was with other people and how she, you know, she inspired me to um, continue with what I wanted to do. Um, at, at the time I was sort of questioning my being and my worth because I'd brought up all my children, they were off doing their own thing and I was well, what do I do with myself now, you know, as a single person? Um, and I just started to question myself and um, um, through seeing Desiree um, and how she um, helped others, I thought that um, it would be something that I could continue to do myself. And um, yeah, that's how I initially met Desiree. Um, but like Laura said and Desiree said, they, um, they, have, they give you so much um, opportunities to join various things you know what you like like now I'm official Q volunteer because I done the um, I done the um, Hodge culture course that was referred to through Shepherd Star so you get that opportunity and I done the explore um, that like Desiree said it gives you strength and belief within yourself with the lovely Susie that would um, she's got a book called seven St the seven steps and I still carry it around with me now, a year later, and refer to it, and it helps me with the breathing and the well-being. And um, the lovely Rachel with the um, English Heritage um, Marble Hill House, I'm now going to be a volunteer for that, to show the rooms and talk about the rooms. So, yeah, and it's all down to uh, meeting Desiree, um, and I'm so thankful for that. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah, amazing. I just want to quickly jump in here. When I met Denise and I uh, connected over a coffee, must have been because that's generally how we connect coffee, cake, food. <laughs> and yeah. we, were having, we were having our first conversation and I said to her, oh, do you mind sharing your number? And I took my phone and I actually put in her name, Denise Shepherd Star Volunteer. And, and that was on day one. And not only does she help us, but she helps other part organizations that we partner with. So she's just 
you know, one of the bravest, most courageous women that I know. Thank you. It's a real privilege. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, as both Denise and Desiree have mentioned, we do something on a monthly basis called Table of Hope, and it is a communal lunch over a shared table. And we'd love to give you a little glimpse into the joy that is Table of Hope. So if I can draw your attention to a video we're going to call up now, it's very short, it's just two and a half minutes, and you might just Ooh. catch sight of one or two familiar faces in it. But this will just give you a little glimpse into what is Table of Hope. We're at the Aetna Community Centre today in Richmond to support Shepherd Star with their Table of Hope initiative. We're happy we came here today as Econocom and Trump's representatives. We helped serve food today to the Table of Hope and we got to meet really, really nice people. My name is Denise. I come to the Table of Hope to meet new people, to enjoy the company and the delicious food and to find out what's happening in the community. We love having the Table of Hope. Mohammed has bought these beautiful petals. Because of Econocom, we're able to gather around the table today and enjoy a lovely Thai meal. Last month, the UK team took part in a boxing fundraiser in partnership with Trams Limited and raised money to be able to support this Table of Hope today. I think it's a really great initiative. It's something a little bit unique and something a little bit different for Econocom to take part in. We think Table of Hope's a really good idea because it gets people off the streets, it gives them a full meal and it's really nice to be there as well with all the com different companies yeah. and people and everything. Yeah, to different to different people and have, you know, make new friends. Yeah, yeah the company's really the most important thing. It was really nice being there so we could uh, put things into perspective and see where our money went. It's been really nice to watch everyone and see how much they've enjoyed today yeah. and see kind of what they get out of it. It's really, really rewarding. Jermaine, this is your first time at Table of Hope and how did you find your experience? Oh, I'm just, look, look at the smile on my face. I mean, literally, I just can't believe it. It's just been wonderful, really. And just meeting all of these people and then when the food came out, oh, I haven't tasted food like that in a long time. Absolutely out of this world. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to Desiree and Shepherd Star for having us today. It's been really nice to join in. Just to quickly paint a bit of a picture, July 2022 is our one year anniversary of Table of Hope. When we started it, it was just simply a, we need to gather people in community to have a meal because people have been for so long without connection because of the pandemic. We started in July 2021 and we have this month, our celebrating next week at Kew Gardens, one year, businesses supporting us. So we get local businesses, restaurants, hoteliers to support us and find a venue that can now seat. We're seating about 45, 55 people all across community. We've done 444 meals. We've had volunteers serve, I think it's, I can't remember how many hours, but considerable generosity of their time serving. And for us, the heart of it is connecting around a bowl of food. Yeah. And it's been such joy to watch it grow. Thank you. Um, as Desiree mentioned, she used the word connecting and the word community. And it's my great privilege now to introduce two phenomenal women. And these are two community connectors. They are entrepreneurs, they are women of influence. I'd love to invite Cornelia, founder of Makers United to come up and Susie, creator of Seven Simple Steps to come up. So without further ado, Cornelia, could you share a little bit about who you are and how Makers United came about? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for being here. 
Um, I can see some of my students uh, in the audience. Hello, hello. <laughs> Um, I trained as an English teacher in my home country. I've been here 20 years and um, I've never thought that I would be so involved in the communi community. I've, I've started just by sharing what I love. I, there is a little clue in the picture. Um, I love sewing um, and I, I love sharing what I, uh, what I love. So um, when when I met Desiree, I didn't believe in myself that much. Um, well, I speak a different language at home, uh, as some of the people in the audience who are now my students, I started teaching again once a week. Um, but uh, when I met Desiree, she, she believed in me. She believed that I could bring something to the community, that um, my skills would be useful. I didn't believe in myself that much, but she did. And she entrusted me with a studio in Richmond with no furniture at all, no sewing machines. We started with one, one day a week and um, I've, I've been there for six years. I left a couple of months ago and it was an amazing experience. I've met many, many women. Um, some of the volunteers are here. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Um, I couldn't have done without, I, I couldn't have done what I've done without you all. Um, I, I, when people talk about community, um, community to me is my second family. Mm. I've, I've been here 20 years and as a, as a speaker of other language uh, in my own home, that can be quite isolating. Um, the decision to get out of the house and meet people and get involved has changed my life. It has transformed it. And any, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Mm. And I have to say that I am connected in so many ways with so many people and, uh, and I feel grateful. Mm. Um, I get out and I say hello and I smile. Somebody smiles back. That's important to me. Um, when Desiree said, you can do it, because uh, we've started with the project teaching the homeless how to repair their clothes. And that took about six months. And the next year she called me and said, uh, I think we can do this together. And we've done it. Mm. Uh, we kept the studio open during pandemic between lockdowns. And we've seen so many women coming to use the sewing machines. We s we've made separate sections, separate stations where they can feel safe. We kept the windows and the doors opened. We kept the table in the middle so they can come. Um, where if, if they couldn't handle it at home, and we had women who couldn't handle it at home. There, were, there was too much. Their children were crying. They were, the, the teenagers were really difficult to handle. So they were coming and just, sometimes they wouldn't use the sewing machine. They were just there to be with other people. Mm. And um, I felt like, I have, I felt useful. I, I felt that I could, thank you for that heart. Um, I felt that I can, I can help them in a way, and in some way in those difficult times. Um, in my description, I have four sewing machines. I used to have seven, uh, but I only have four at the moment. And because I have them, I feel like I can create something. I can make something. Um, I can repair. Um, and that's pretty much it. And Susie. Juanita, do you mind if I use that? My yeah, mic sure. is just popping on and off. Um, so Susie, as creator of Take Seven Simple Steps, it's a well-being program. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how did that come about? Um, well, firstly, I'm very thankful to be here tonight. Um, I'm here because, again, of Desiree and Cornelia. Um, from, a, from a young Susie, age... can you just pop a chair for me? Just yeah, is that better? That's Sorry, perfect. everybody. Is that better? It's the first time I've spoken with a microphone, so you have to excuse me. Um, from a young age, I always had this desire to inspire young girls, and I love to run, and I dreamt that one day the Olympics would be a platform for me to be able to do that. 
and it was a dream that took me on a wonderful journey where I learnt many, many life lessons. Um, at the age of uh, 15, I lost a really close friend to cancer and as a result, I questioned the purpose of life really early on. Uh, I had the opportunity at 17 to go to America uh, on a sports scholarship, an athletic scholarship. And my parents were incredible because they encouraged me to go and to study what I loved to do, which was art. And it was there that I met, I fell in love with an African-American footballer and we got married. And his background was so different to mine, uh, coming from a white middle-class background. Through him, I got a tiny glimpse through a window of what it was like to be a minority. I saw, um, sorry, just bear with me one second. I saw um, what was a result of, I think, years of systematic racism that still exists today, where families were struggling to try and break cycles of poverty, crime and injustices, and it just spurred my passion to want to help others more. Um, he also introduced me to gospel music and to church, and for years I was the only white person in the congregation, and I remember vividly sitting through those services and watching women that had experienced so much pain in their lives, yet they would dance with so much joy and so full of hope and faith that, that inspired me more. Um, when I graduated, I continued working as a designer and I set up a graphic design business because that was what I was able to do as a result of studying art, which was amazing, but I got to travel. So I spent time at altitude in Ethiopia with some of the greatest athletes in the world, but they had all their belongings in a shoebox. And that was another life-changing lesson for me because they were so content. Um, and then in my late 30s, I personally went through a really challenging time and I drew strength from women that had experienced what, I guess what we'd call like insurmountable circumstances and challenges, but they'd risen above and become stronger, became stronger. Um, it was around this time that I, um, I paused running and had children and I wasn't able to return to running. And I remember I created a whole new vision board, a whole new way I thought that I could inspire women. It involved a well-being program, Pilates, dance, yoga. It was a huge vision. The women were going to sew and make ethical, sustainable clothing collections. And I broke it into phases. And phase one was to make the clothing. And that's where I met Desiree and Cornelia. I walked into the Works of Love project that was going on at the time. And they were just so amazing. They just embraced everything I shared and just their love for community and wanting to help others was just inspirational to me. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them tonight and the program wouldn't exist. And then lockdown came. Um, my graphic design business slowed. I paused phase one and that's when the wellbeing program developed. <laughs> Lots of coffees for Desiree, walks <laughs> and um, chats with amazing family and friends and the wellbeing program at Q and books are now, are now here, which is, which is incredible. Oh, and an amazing space at Live Well Q as well. So, yeah, Thank you it. so much, Susie. Thank you. So there's definitely a theme. There's community, there's connection, there's conversation, and very clearly coffee as well. Um, so now the two of you have got some incredible things happening. Could you tell us a little bit more about what are the events and programs um, at Makers United and Take Seven Simple Steps that anyone from our audience could perhaps attend or come along to? Cornelian. Well, I forgot to mention about Makers United. <laughs> well, it's, it's a community of makers. Uh, I've decided during the pandemic that I would like to share even more from what I've learned. I would like to have a team that would advise makers like myself on business, on how to set up a social enterprise, how to, to, to uh, become a sole trader, and just shorten the journey for those makers because mine was quite long. And uh, I sort of had a sense of urgency. So I thought if I set up a social enterprise, I will also share the fact that women can earn money. I love working with charities, but I think I would like to encourage women to earn money. 
mm. because they can become independent. Uh, they can have, if they become independent, they can make decisions whether their, their marriage works or doesn't work. So um, that's why it's a social enterprise. Um, now, Makers United has started in uh, 2020, um, and we've run quite a few programs. We've, and we were asked, what is the difference between you and other organizations? And I would say that we are always available. Mm -hmm. So if anybody approaches us, um, we find time to meet. Uh, we find time to hold that hand that needs us then because we all have it in us. We just need that encouragement from mm. somebody else. Well so this is what we do. Mm. Uh, we, will, we were privileged enough to get some funding from Re Richmond Parish Lens, so we will be starting a tutoring program. I, will, um, I would be more than happy to teach other makers to become tutors like myself. Um, we need more craft tutors in the community, in secondary schools, in primary schools. We don't have, in my opinion, enough craft tutors. It's good for us, it's good for our, our well-being to, to be able to create crafts. Mm. Um, and, it's, and you can earn money from it, it's really up to you. So we're starting in, uh, in autumn, I'm hoping September. Um, and we also have talks at Live Well which is an amazing place, and I would strongly recommend you visit it. <laughs> it's in queue. We have talks every month on certain on, on subjects like social media, photography, we have our photographer here, uh, and subjects that makers are interested in, um, and they can learn from the experts. Thank you so much. And Susie, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about Take 7 Simple Steps. Um, so it's currently running at Live Well Q, again with the generous support of Richmond Parish Lands and now the National Rotary Community Fund, which is amazing, and Live Well Q are very supportive. It runs on Friday mornings for a couple of hours for blocks of six weeks. The idea being that women in the local community who might be feeling like they want to improve their overall well-being um, and might at times feel periodically have low mood or frequent low mood and just want to be inspired can come along um, and we offer a sliding scale of payments so people can actually be socially prescribed through live well Q, or they can pay an, a minimal donation or if they can afford more they pay more and the idea is that nobody pays who's no one knows who's paid what and that everyone who wants to gets to experience um, this beautiful, envi beautiful environment um, I'm also, as has been touched upon briefly, very privileged to be able to share the seven steps through Desiree's Explore program, um, at Shepherd Star Explore program, which has been amazing. And the digital element of the program has recently, well, soon to be launched. There's a new content hub. It's like a, an internet for prisons. And um, there's one in women's prisons around the UK that's in the process of being set up. So women will be able to access the digital version of that um, we piloted a, a schools program for teenagers at Christ, Church, Christ Secondary School, which was also fantastic. And um, I've co-written a couple of children's books with an athlete called Chrissy Wellington, um, an amazing athlete. And that makes the steps available to, to children to understand and learn as well. Thank you so much. Um, Yay! <laughs> And I am conscious of time marching swiftly on. So before we wind up tonight, is there one piece of encouragement, one takeaway, one piece of inspiration you could possibly gift our audience today as their takeaway? Cornelia, do you have something you could share? Get involved. 80% <laughs> um, of what I am is that I've been there, as uh, Woody Allen would say. So I am everywhere. I am at networking <laughs> meetings. I am with Desiree when she needs me. Um, so my face is quite familiar. Although I don't understand from the very beginning what's going on, I am just there and find out. Mm. So get involved. Thank you. Denise. <laughs> um, I would just like to stay, say, to stay strong and positive so you can continue to succeed and make the best life for yourself. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. When I was growing up, we had a golden rule in our home. 
I carried that golden rule into my workplaces. I used to have it on the wall. It's now in our family home. And it's that ancient truth of do unto others as you would have do unto yourself. Thank you. That's my encouragement. Susie. Um, one thing I try and do before going to sleep at night is to remember something that I'm thankful for and to think about um, the things I love to do and to think of one tiny step that I can take to make that a reality. And um, I just wanted to encourage everyone in here um, today. I think sometimes life can seem overwhelming, but when we look up to the sky at night and you see how vast it is and all the stars and everything, just to remember how amazing you all are and the potential that you have inside of you and the ability to do what you put your mind to. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Rachel. I think we're going to open the floor to some questions. Is that right? Yes. If anyone has a burning question, please feel free to ask it to our amazing panel. Thank you. That was really inspiring. Um, you clearly have, have a lot of corporate sponsors and partners. When you were first setting up Shepherd Star, at what point did you approach these corporations? And how did you get them on your side? Hmm. I think the benefit that I had when we set up Shepherd Star is that I've been a local Richmond resident for 20 years. I also worked in corporate in, in Richmond. And so my network extended quite far. And of course, the children at school, getting to know some of the parents in business. So there was uh, already a natural uh, foundation of good business contacts. And then, of course, we've worked with uh, Visit Richmond, who did a lot of connecting for us. Um, we've worked with um, a lot of cold calling as well, <laughs> knocking on the door. Uh, my belief is, and, and some really has been knocking on the door and saying, hi, we're Shepherd Star. Have you got a few moments? And my belief is, especially coming out of the pandemic, is that People, businesses want to contribute to community to make it a healthier one. And I believe everyone's got something to give, whether that's an hour that they put their employees forward to volunteer, or whether like for what you saw in the video, Econocom, um, being able to fund a, a community gathering. So it is really about using the networks and building continually new ones. And there's some that completely get your vision and the, the sales pitch, if you like, is, is an easy one because they completely understand, yes, we want to build a healthier community, let's do it together. And those are the ones that naturally align. And then there's the ones that you knock on the door and you go back and you knock on the door, hi, it's me again and then again and it's like, okay, there's right. they're not going to align, just move on. So. Um, it's a continual effort and we've got some good partners and we will continue to build on that foundation of corporate partners because for us, it's a, a collaboration. It is the business sector, it is the charity, it's the statutory and I love it how woven together just forms something beautifully unique and each one has a valuable part to play. Thank you so much. Um, well, my heart's pounding with inspiration and being touched firstly. Um, but secondly, what was very poignant for me is the space that we created for women to access as well as it being ex accessible ex inclusively. But what really stood out for me was when you mentioned, Cornelia, uh, that women were able to come to a safe space mm. to be creative and the crafting, but for the well-being because of what they couldn't handle at home. And importantly, it's not just what the changes of handling the home life, but maybe even escaping domestic violence and having that safe space. I, I'm really touched by that. And I think there is definitely room for that to expand. Mm, so to be good. able to have even under the, you know, the title of, oh, I'm going to a craft and creative kind of space for a few hours. I'm sure that was pretty life saving and life changing for women to be safe from violence as well. So thank you. You're absolutely right. This is our vision. We, we would like to create more safe spaces. Um, I am volunteer at Ham Youth Center and I've seen teenagers, they need a safe space to create. Mm. Uh, there aren't enough craft um, workshops in school. So this is what we'd like to do in the future. 
and obviously we would like the council to get involved so that's on my agenda for next year thank you hi i am adriana dixon i am a member of the makers united i am a compatriot of cornelia i'm a romanian i uh, started a business of leather goods and i uh, create them as well as design them i trained and trained for years but i like to ask how do we get involved to pass on skills because I recognize the fact into my own daughters, um, they become better consumers if they know how mm. a handbag is made or a belt or a card holder or whatever it is made. They can see the effort that goes into it and they just become better buyers when they go and buy their own things. They know some things is disposable rather than appreciate appreciating something that is long lasting so it has a huge impact on my family but um, as far I know Cornelia is going to mentor me she is an amazing mentor and she does get involved and she is there when nobody else is mm -hmm. so this has been an amazing surprise but I like to come forward to pass on my skills so I I want to ask how else do we come forward in the society apart from just putting courses online how else do we volunteer as creative people mm. and I like any answer any of you to answer I'm very inspired by all of you so thank mm. you so much for this evening Thank you, Adriana, for all those beautiful words. Uh, first of all, there are some secondary schools without a craft tutor. Mm -hmm. So um, you can run an after school club. So we can introduce you to a secondary school. You can initiate a couple of sessions on how to make a little pouch from leather. Yeah, I think girls do benefit from understanding how things are made and how they can buy things for themselves with the understanding of how does it how is that made so i think that's very important for our daughters as far as it is and myself. the conversations you've mentioned are really important in schools i don't think they the the, the young people know enough um, and we're going to initiate some talks in in secondary schools and you're more than welcome i have somebody here who is already <laughs> Um, Ghislaine, she's, uh, she's into an environment, we have learned so much from Ghislaine, she is going to be our first speaker, so she's going to go into a secondary school and start about, uh, yes, <laughs> she will tell you more about that, so okay. thank you for that. Thank you, I actually wanted to, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I just, I wanted to add something to what Adriana said, because as well as working with secondary schools and, and young girls, I think actually all of us could benefit from learning how to make things because uh, one of the problems with fast fashion at the moment is that we don't, we've lost some of those skills. Mm. And so it is a community effort and it is, all, it is a, as much about educating ourselves and those around us. Um, and I have an initiative which thanks to Cornelia, I probably wouldn't have been able to get it off the ground. So, um, if anyone wants to talk to me about the revolving wardrobe and some of the activities that I want to attach to that, this is part of uh, Makers United, which is an incredible organization. Mm. Well done, Cornelia. Beautiful. I think that's, uh, that concludes all of our amazing speakers. I'm going to hand over to um, the wonderful Angela to tell you a bit more, but on behalf of English Heritage, can I say a huge thank you for being so inspirational. Oh, thank you. Okay, so hello, it's Angela from Visit Richmond, which is part of Richmond Council, um, and we promote uh, local business, we also promote uh, the attractions of what there is to see and do, but more importantly, I just want to say thank you. The love that's in the room this evening is absolutely amazing, um, and the energy as well, and just to say thank you to Desiree for being the catalyst. Mm. Um, it's been amazing, I've known you for many years. Um, you're a powerhouse <laughs> uh, and um, I just want to say thank you to every single woman you're truly delicious um, Denise thank you um, I'd say we'd never have known this was your first public speaking um, thank you for being a shepherd star thank you for all your volunteering that you do um, it's incredible 
Uh, thank you, Cornelia, for starting Makers United. Very inspiring. Uh, we will connect you with others as well. I think it is important. I think there isn't enough about craft. I think right now schools are just focusing on maths and science, when in fact we should be focusing more on the creativity. Mm. Thank you, Susie. Susie's got to stand outside. Um, and in fact, yes, I'm going to promote £24 for a six-week course. That's only £4 a week. And that's less than a bottle of wine or, or, or water. Um, and I'd say that's fantastic. And finally, thank you to Laura for being incredible and for ensuring that everybody was on time and asking wonderful questions. So my challenge, before I finish, is twofold. One is I think, and forgive me, but this is for the men as well, we all need to be warrior women. That was one of my things that I picked up. The others is what makes you rise in the morning or the evening, depending on when you rise. Um, and then of course, the other is thank you so much for what you said. Susie, look up to the stars. What are you thankful for? And what are you going to focus on? I think that's fantastic. Now for the sales pitch, Richmond Council. <laughs> so Richmond Council, we do actually have Richmond Hub, which is great for businesses. So we've got free courses. Um, we've got the ability to do blogs about local business. If you've got any businesses that you want to um, promote, please let us know. We also have that on the Visit Richmond website as well. Thank you to Councillor Koza for being um, in the audience this evening. Um, he's the lead for Richmond Council for the White Ribbon Charity, Domestic Violence. We're raising money for them as well. Um, with regards to safe space, I don't know whether you're aware, but Friday and Saturday evenings, there's now a gazebo that's outside Richmond Station. So it's an opportunity for people to go, um, women, men, anybody that needs somewhere safe to be. And then we've also got the gorgeous Rachel. Thank you, ravishing Rachel. There we go, the alliteration. Um, who, thank you so much, English Heritage, for sponsoring um, this event. Um, she'll be on hand to talk more about Henry Hetter Henry here to Howard. Henry, I'm sorry, thank you. And then thank you, Anna, for hosting us as well at the yeah. Richmond Hillcraft Adult Community College. Mm. So just to say thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Please book for our final inspirational women's talk, 28th of July. It's all a homage to Henrietta Howard. Um, as we've heard now, what a truly inspirational woman. 16, orphaned, went off, decided that she needed to get in with the... Um, the royalty, became a servant to the queen, lover to the king. I'd love to be around that dinner table. But yeah. there we go. So please come. And with no further ado, thank you. So huge round of applause for the ladies. Thank you.